So I'd first of all like to give um, a brief overview of the framework um, and how it works for um, allowing access to the past web. Uh, then we'll go to um, how deployment uh, has coming along, how it's been used for data, uh, discovery of mementos, branding of archives, and finally some alternate uh, web archiving strategies that we've been researching. So the middle two, um, to throw back to Christine's brilliant talk um, earlier, really um, we feel come into the, the same sorts of areas that Christine was talking about in terms of reproducibility, um, access to dynamic data, um, and so forth. Okay, so a brief overview uh, of the framework. So the main goal of Memento uh, is to make it easy to access the web of the past. So say uh, you're on the Tate Online um, site in the UK, you might then want to select a date that you want to see it at rather than the current version, and magically you arrive back into 2008 in the state that the uh, website was uh, at that point. And in this case, we've gotten it from uh, the National Archives. So in this case, we have uh, the reverse trend from what Christine was talking about, where instead of uh, going from static to dynamic, we want to take that dynamic content and go back to previous static snapshots. And we want to do that automatically. We achieve this by introducing a uniform version access capability to the web that allows you um, to specify in one common way the time uh, that you want uh, to see the website at. So the web um, has various content management systems. Uh, these are designed to be aware of all of the versions of a resource. They're kind of self-contained. Um, they have a variety of proprietary uh, version linking mechanisms, uh, interlinking mechanisms, and of course, this has the great advantage that the dyna dy dynamism is managed. However, the web in general is completely the opposite. It does, it's designed to forget about prior versions of a resource. It's very distributed, and hence the management um, of the whole thing is an impossibility. So we have a pretty hard task in order to marry those two. There are, of course, uh, various resource versions online in various content management systems, uh, such as MediaWiki or WordPress, uh, in web archives, such as Brewster's Disruptive Internet Archive, uh, the UK Web Archive, Archive-It, and so forth. Transactional archives that we'll talk about a bit later in the uh, alternate or alternative uh, web archiving strategies. And of course, in search engine caches. But at an architectural level, the web has a very hard time dealing with these things. You can't talk about a resource as it used to be. You can only talk about the resource as it is now. The web is always in the present and never talking about the past. If you know uh, the current URI for um, a resource, you can't go from there automatically back to the prior state of the resource. And uh, given a prior state of the resource, you can't get from there back to the one that it was um, archived an archive of. So there are, of course, various approaches for this but they're all very localized and ad hoc. You know, the Internet Archive isn't a standard, it doesn't um, obey the rules of the web architecture directly, um, and so forth. It's one centralized uh, archive. So this is what we want to try and change. So we regard the web as a single large content management system. So what we need to do is introduce a single uniform way um, of accessing versions of resources across the web. To do that, we're not going to reinvent the wheel and try to compete with the Internet Archive, of course, uh, but instead leverage all of the systems in which archived or um, the past state snapshots um, of resources are available. So that includes web archives, of course, 
but also content management systems such as uh, MediaWiki, software version systems, and so forth. Memento's approach in this regards ticks almost all of the boxes that Christine brought up. Uh, it's distributed, so versions can exist on several uh, servers around the place. Um, we use time as our global version indicator you know, to say that something is version 1.0 or 1.2 really doesn't mean anything in a global sense. Um, so the only way that we can make use of any sort of indicator uh, is to have the, the, con the global time. And it's based on the primitives uh, of the World Wide Web, a resource, the state of the resource, which is a representation, uh, content negotiation, and linking between resources. Okay, so this is the current state of the web, essentially. We have um, this gray ball on the left, which is uh, CNN. And that's the current state of the CNN homepage. In the Internet Archive, of course, there's a whole bunch of different versions of um, the CNN homepage, such as uh, from April 2001, August 2007, and so forth. And there's no connection between those resources. You can't get from CNN to the Internet Archive, and unless you deconstruct the URI, you can't get from the Internet Archive to CNN. So what we want to do is introduce something in the middle that allows us to make those uh, negotiations. We do that by introducing a resource that we call a time gate. As you can see, um, we've had a lot of fun coming up with names for things, and when uh, we at Los Alamos announced that we'd produce a time gate for the World Wide Web, we got a, rather a lot of uh, unintended publicity as well as intended publicity. So this time gate um, performs something called content negotiation, which happens all the time with browsers. So if you go to one site on your iPhone versus on your PC and you get a different site, that's content negotiation. Uh, and we make use of that capability to content negotiate in time instead of for format. So you go to CNN, there's a link from CNN to a time gate. The time gate then performs the content negotiation based on time, and you end up in the Internet Archive. This is the bridge from the present to the past. We also want to have a bridge from the past to the present without knowing exactly when the lightning bolt's going to hit the steeple so you can have the DeLorean going at 88 miles an hour with the, the hook. So without without going into uh, that much detail, um, there's a, a link back from the uh, archive resources through to uh, the current representation at CNN.com. And that's it. That's the, that's the entire framework that allows us to get from the current resources uh, through to their archived state. One thing that's really important to notice is that this solution works in a very distributed fashion. You can have multiple archives um, all integrated within the same system, such as the Internet Archive, Archivet, um, all of the national libraries have archives and so forth. Uh, web citation would be another example. So in this case, when we're building up uh, the CNN homepage, we might use that uh, that HTTP link to the time gate, then from there content negotiate to find the best resource as it appears in all of the different archives rather than just going to the Internet Archive and hoping it's got the most appropriate copies. So if you didn't follow any of that, that's fine. Uh, here is the one page or one slide uh, memento interaction summary that you can that you can hopefully take home. So first of all, the browser goes to the resource that it's interested in, which we call the original resource, and it says, do you have a preferred time gate? Do you know where to go to find old versions of yourself? It might say, yes, please go and see this resource that we call G. But in the current state of the web, it's very likely to say, no, I have no idea what you're talking about. 
you should use a, def a default. So after selecting um, or being offered a time gate, the browser then goes, goes to that time gate and says, where's the archived copy of the resource for the time that I want? The time gate then says, it's, uh, I know about that resource, it's at M, or I really don't know what you're talking about, you should try another time gate. And at that point, you would then cycle through the time gates that you know about, looking for one that will recognize the resource. Then finally, you'd go to the archive copy and say, hi, uh, I want a copy of you, and it delivers it back. So that is Memento in a, in a nutshell. So what I want to talk about for the rest of the presentation is where we've gone from this, um, how we're using it, uh, how it's being deployed. So we've been really lucky um, with our deployment, um, and we've made really significant progress towards getting this um, implemented and used. First of all, we're going through the standardization process uh, with the IETF. Um, on the left, you can see a, a screenshot of the, uh, the current internet draft. Um, and we're going to release a new uh, version before too long uh, to try and get some more feedback before we go to a final call for that. Uh, we've had a lot of interest from both the IETF and the W3C, um, including people like Tim Berners-Lee, Mark Nottingham, and Michael Housen Plus. On the client side, uh, we have uh, various Memento-capable clients that have been developed uh, by both ourselves and, and others. Uh, we have an add-on for Firefox called Memento Fox, which is fully operational um, and has been endorsed by Mozilla, um, and an experimental version for uh, Internet Explorer. There's also been uh, mobile device support uh, that has been developed uh, by others, um, including an operational Memento client for Android um, and an iPhone, iPad version, which is currently being developed. Uh, we discuss our work on this um, in the next version of the Code for Lib Journal, um, which hopefully should be out this month. Thanks to Chris Carpenter, who I see. Um, we have uh, been very fortunate to get uh, the support of the Internet Archive, um, of course, Bruce DeCal. Um, so the Internet Archive is now Memento compliant. That means that anything um, in the Internet Archive can be accessed through uh, one of our browser add-ons. It's also been released uh, as version 1.6 to the Web Archiving community. Um, so as Web Archives upgrade, they will become Memento compliant. So we hope um, that we'll be able to apply a little bit of pressure uh, at the IIPC meeting um, next month uh, to try and get people to move to that version. So if you have a, um, an internet archive, or a web archive, I should say, um, which you're responsible for or related to, um, please have them upgrade to 1.6. It doesn't just do Memento, it also has a whole bunch of other um, impressive uh, features. On the server side, we also have um, an operational plugin for MediaWiki, uh, which is the platform that Wikipedia uses, uh, as one of many examples. Uh, it's also been installed on the W3C Wiki, um, which makes it Memento compatible, so you can go back and see all of the old versions of the pages uh, using the Memento uh, clients. So again, if you have a MediaWiki, somewhere, uh, please install the plugin. You can get it from the, um, the tools URI there or directly from um, the MediaWiki website. We have a validator. One of the things which a lot of people have been asking, asking us about is, hey, we really like Memento. We think we've done it right, but we're not sure. Can you have a look at it? Um, so we put up this automated tool that goes off and acts like a Memento client and tries to do all of the interactions that a regular client would do. 
So you give it a URI um, for a time gate, for an original resource, or for a memento, um, and it will go through and report the success or failure um, for each of the different sorts of interactions that a regular memento client would do. And this validator is then kept up to date with the IETF um, internet draft. So when we make a change to the internet draft, we then update it in the validator to make sure that everyone's on the same page. We realize that it's going to be quite a while before everyone becomes Memento compliant. Um, so we also have made quite a lot of uh, progress in proxy support. So this is a system, or these are systems, I should say, that are hosted uh, by Los Alamos and Old Dominion, which make uh, internet sites that have snapshots of versions Memento compliant by proxy. So the web archives um, are an obvious uh, point, but also all, well not all, uh, all of the uh, media wiki systems that we know about um, are compliant by proxy, including things like Wikipedia and uh, Wikia. Of course, we'd prefer that everything was natively, su uh, natively supported Memento. Uh, however, we realize that this is a, a stopgap measure in order to make the, uh, the websites available to, mem bleh, to Memento clients uh, by their bootstraps. Documentation work is ongoing. Uh, we try to um, include more information about uh, introductions to understand uh, the Memento system, how to recognize a Memento, a TimeGate, or, or an original resource just using the HTTP headers. Um, guidelines for servers that host mementos, and so on and so forth. Uh, we're constantly trying to update that information. Um, if there's anything that would be helpful in the guide, please let us know, and we'll do our best to include it. As far as funding goes, uh, we started off with a very small grant um, between 2007 and, and 2010. Um, of which only about $50,000 um, went towards memento work. And it was more uh, exploratory and scope defining. We were then very fortunate to get a much larger grant of a million dollars uh, from the Library of Congress uh, for uh, 2010 and, and all of this year to do things like specification and hence the internet draft uh, outreach such as today. Um, tool development for both client and server, um, and further research that we'll, we'll get towards. Okay, so Memento and data. We feel that Memento's time travel on the web possibilities are really powerful, and not just for the human web, but also for the semantic web in which machines crawl around looking for data uh, that they can interact with. This uses a process called following your nose um, in HTTP speak. Um, so I'll give you a, a quick walkthrough about how it will work for the human side, and then we'll try and relate that, oh, oops, sorry. Relate that over to the, the data side um, for how a machine might use this. So that's the Memento framework. You've got the current representation of CNN, obviously intended for humans. Um, you can go to a time gate. The time gate then sends you to an archive copy, which is closest in time to where you want to be. So we have a, a pick of the day um, at Los Alamos, which is uh, Herbert sending next to a um, folder on which we superimpose the current um, copy of the BBC. That's our original resource, which has the URI in the slide. You can then get from there to a time gate. The time gate will take you to the archive versions. From this, we can do some cute things by just following those redirections, following those interactions, and build a library, a little um, movie in which Time goes forwards, 
and Herbert's t-shirt changes, uh, the date goes forwards and so on. So this is cute, but not very useful because it's just a movie. Okay, enough of Herbert. So a really quickly inserted slide. Thank you very much for Christine for bringing this up. So as data becomes uh, more dynamic and processes become more dynamic, reproducibility tends towards zero. However, if we had static and discoverable snapshots of both the data and the process, then we could um, have at least points in time in which reproducibility was possible. And that's what we want to do with Memento. So for example, um, there is a linked data version of Wikipedia called DBpedia. They take the information from Wikipedia, scrape out everything that they can, put it into RDF and publish it. And they do this for every single page that has an info box in Wikipedia. They do this every six months and currently they throw away all of the previous versions. Thankfully, they don't actually throw them away. They just store them um, in a big dump file. So we can do Memento on them. So to walk through the, the same process, we start with the original resource, which is an RDF description of France. We follow the time gate link to the time gate. We then can negotiate in date time to say, I want the version of this data as it was at a particular point in time. We follow that link and we get the data that we're interested in. We can do that for all of the versions in order to build up time series data uh, for processing. So, to practice what we preach, uh, we did exactly that. Uh, this is a graph of the GDP per capita um, which we built up over time just using HTTP interactions with Memento. So here's the first version of DBpedia in September 2007. And then every six months they publish a new version. Of course, by that time, the data in Wikipedia has changed, and hence we get a new data point. So, to take the United States as an example, it stays pretty constant through various versions. Then in 2008, in November, sorry, in uh, 2009, it jumps up to here and then remains static again. But then other ones are, other graphs are more up and down. And you can see the trends um, of the GDP per capita, um, which we built up just from using Memento uh, against the original resource to find the archive versions. So this isn't a particularly useful to economists piece of information. I'm sure they have much, much better sources. But you can imagine Take, you know, take that out to the nth degree, you apply it across all of the information in Wikipedia and hence DBpedia, and it can become really powerful. Okay, uh, memento and discovery. So another point uh, which Christine made was we need to be able to discover things. We need to have these links between resources uh, which are semantically typed in order to understand how we came from um, where we started. Very few sites currently provide this time gate link and hence we're going to need other methods in order to find mementos. One way that we are looking at uh, doing this is a batch discovery process, uh, which we call a time map. Now, this is an ORE aggregation and object reuse and exchange um, from OAI. And it includes at least uh, all of the URIs and date times of the archive copies of the resource um, that an individual archive uh, knows about. These time maps can then be aggregated across systems in order to provide access um, from one point to resources that are spread all around the web. These uh, aggregators um, could be um, in lots of different places. There could be one at OCLC, one at Los Alamos, and so forth. Um, 
the interesting point is then um, being able to take that information from an aggregator and aggregate it again into other resources. So before long, using a bottom-up approach, you'll end up with at least uh, one aggregator that has access to all of the information um, which is available to Memento clients. The format uh, for these time maps is quite simple. Um, although ORE uses RDF, we've introduced a new, uh, much simpler style, uh, which is based on the link header uh, format, um, which has been recently standardized in the IETF. So in ingesting this information is not difficult. OK, that's great. That means that we can find the mementos themselves, the archived copies, but how do we find the time maps that describe them? One way that we've been uh, thinking about is to use an atom feed that instead of saying, here are all of the mementos, says, here are the time maps for each of the mementos. This would allow applications to remain in sync with um, archives, such as the aggregator, which would redirect clients to the, the right place. In this case, we'd have one atom entry for each original resource, and for each system that hosts mementos. The entry would then provide this time map link to the time map that describes whereabouts each archive copy is and the time at which it was uh, present as the original resource. Uh, at the IIPC meeting um, in The Hague in May, we'll be trying, hopefully, uh, going to discuss this. We've also been thinking about a batch process for discovery of mementos directly. Um, and one way that we've thought about that is to use the robots.txt file, um, which is a file that servers use to convey their uh, policies um, to crawling robots, such as for the Internet Archive. So what we'd like to do there would be to add a directive uh, that supports the discovery of mementos that the server knows about, even if they're maybe not um, directly within that server. So, for example, uh, there's a whole bunch of conference sites uh, for JCDL, the Joint Conference on Digital Libraries, at JCDL 2011, JCDL 2010, JCDL 2001, and, and so on. All of those sites are archived on jcdl.org, the main conference's website such as, um, for example, here, jcdl.org slash archive 2002. So what we'd like to do is have some way that jcdl.org could say, this resource is a memento for jcdl2002.org's uh, homepage. And from there, a memento crawler can simply say, OK, I know that that's a memento if it has all of the appropriate links follow them and find the time maps, crawl the site, find all of the mementos, um, and so forth. Hopefully then, from there, you'd be able to find a, an Atom feed, which has the links to the time maps for all of the resources. And all of a sudden, you have access to all of the information. Just again, by following your nose, starting from one point, and going out and following semantically typed links. Uh, this method we're going to try and promote via the internet draft, um, and hopefully we won't get too much backlash for adding another uh, directive into robots.txt. OK, memento and branding. Uh, this is a, um, a topic which David Rosenthal, also here, uh, has brought to our attention. Um, and we think it's, it's critical to understand um, because if there's no incentive for archives because all of their resources are being displayed out of, out of their own context, um, how do they get funding? How will they uh, promote themselves? So if you think about this in home page, there's some HTML, there's a whole bunch of CSS, there's a whole bunch of images, there's maybe some videos, and they could all be recovered from different web archives. This poses a serious branding challenge for us. 
So currently, if you go to the, the Wayback Machine, the Internet Archive, you'll get this nice header at the top, uh, which is the, the Wayback Machine's branding for this particular page, in this case, uh, February 12 of 2010. So this applies to the whole page because all of those resources came from that archive. However, because Memento is distributed and each resource stands alone, it might decide that the most appropriate copy of uh, this photo is actually in Archivebit or in the UK Web Archive. However, there's no branding associated with it. Even worse, we might get the branding from the Wayback Machine that doesn't have anything to do with this photo. They might not have a copy of that just by the way that the crawler works. Or these images, or this double click ad, or so forth and so on. This is one of the things that we're intending to research. We don't have any uh, great new insights uh, on this yet. Um, some of the proposed, pr propo pr pro uh, proposed approaches um, have been to have a sidebar in which resources um, have their archives advertised, or to have uh, mouse overs that say that this resource comes from a particular web archive. I guess Herbert would have done this talk a lot more slowly than I have, but on to the last one. Um, alternate, alternative web archiving strategies. So, Currently, uh, web archives are all crawl-based, in which you have a robot that crawls the web, records what it sees, and uh, keeps it in the in, in, in archive. What we've been looking at is uh, a process called uh, the transactional archive, in which the server cooperates with the archive to make sure that every single version of a resource gets, uh, gets stored. So here's the current crawl-based approach. You have um, the crawler, so that could be Herotrix from the Internet Archive. It sends a request to, to a web server for a particular resource. It gets back that resource in the response, which it stores somewhere in its very large storage array. So this is great. However, the crawler only sees what it sees. It doesn't see resources that other um, browsers might see. Uh, it can be deceived by cloaking. Um, it can be have the, the geolocation stuff applied to it, so you would only get the US version of the page, whereas you would never see um, the French version of the page, for example. So what we're looking at is um, a server-side transactional archive in which the web server cooperates by sending each version of the resource to a submission system that then puts it into the storage array. And it does this when any old browser triggers it. So this could be someone in Paris comes to the site and gets the French version, and it stores the French version, as opposed to the Internet Archive crawlers, which will only ever see the American version. Um, so this gives us a complete history of the changes of the site. There are some examples of this already that we're not the first people to, to do this. For example, uh, there's a product called TT Apache, which is open source, uh, PageVault, and Vignette Web Capture, which are commercial products. So we've developed um, an Apache module called ModTA for Transactional Archive. Um, which captures the URI, the headers in the body of the response, and then at the same time as returning it to the client, it also posts it to the Transactional Archive's submission uh, URI. So here's mod TA, when it gets the request into the web server. This copies the information over to our Grizzly-based web uh, submission system, which then stores it in the file system and the metadata in a Berkeley DB. At the same time, Apache also then sends it back to the browser, um, to the real user. So we've been running a transactional archive on that pick of the day site, um, and, all of, and also on the mementowweb.org site. So if you've 
happen to have hit that up um, during the talk, then you've populated a new instance of, a, um, of one of those pages uh, in, our, in our file system. So that's the, the storage side. On the access side, um, we of course natively support Memento, and hence if you go to mementoweb.org with a Memento client, you can go back and see all of those previous versions. The archived content is currently immediately available, um, although in the release version we'll have the option for um, an embargo period. And we support the export of uh, the WARC files, which is the um, standard for archiving, uh, for transferring, I should say, um, archived uh, web resources. A development timeline. Um, currently, we're finalizing some of the uh, development um, at Los Alamos, such as the embargo periods and so forth, uh, some of the configuration options. And this is being tested both at ODU um, and with some other partners. The submission and access is finalized. Um, and yeah, as I said, the de development focus is going to be on collection management um, and configuration. We hope to release a version of this um, this year, uh, probably um, in the, the fall. Uh, it'll be open source. Um, and of course, any uh, contributions to that work would be appreciated. So that's our update. Um, again, Herbert would like to apologize for not being here. Um, and if there are any questions, I'd be very happy to answer them. Hello. Um, I'm, I'm wondering how Memento deals with the challenge that uh, sites aren't, as, as we were hearing this morning, static anymore. And I'm thinking in terms of WordPress, for example, mm -hmm. that um, I could imagine creating a, a time gate in WordPress somehow that was aware of WordPress's own um, storage of revision history, presented something. Um, that was at a certain time, as it was at a certain time in the past. But then WordPress isn't simply the content. It's also a skin that people have created. It's whatever other pieces are in a sidebar. So it can't do, it, it can't even present its own site probably a few years down the road the way it actually was at a point in time. So when you're thinking about developing a, a memento awareness in something like a media wiki or a WordPress or tools of that sort. What does that really mean and, and what would the creators of that kind of compatibility need to try to be aware of and do? Yeah. So you, you bring up a very good point. Um, for media wiki, we're pretty fortunate that they're, um, they have very good archiving or uh, version history of almost everything. Uh, they don't have a good version history for the uh, themes. Um, however, it's, it is available and you can, uh, or the resources are available, I should say. However, you can't just install a plugin for it. You need to actually get in and modify the core code. Uh, WordPress, we did, I don't think we've looked at WordPress actually. Uh, we looked at Drupal and found that their underlying version management system is not as strong as MediaWiki's. Um, and they reuse URIs in certain circumstances. So that makes it slightly troubling. Um, so for the uh, themes and images, uh, having copies of them um, at, with times is, uh, is very important so that you can then, instead of having it as part of the content system for um, WordPress, if they were in an external archive, then because we're into this distributed, you could then fetch them, fetch the images in the CSS and so forth from the from that archive rather than directly from WordPress. Yeah, I, okay. I, I know what you're just about to say. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, if you get in and modify the code, of course, if you change the PHP, 
then you have another problem all together. Well, and, and the essence of themes and skinning is often code. And so it, it, it won't run enough. You may be running a future version that can no longer even run the theme. And it feels like you're back in the world where all you can rely on is the Internet Archive kind of snapshot of the day. Yeah. It's very hard to imagine how we're going to get even systems with revision history to, to do this job. So, yeah. so uh, there, are, there are two things that were, two ways that we're approaching this problem. The naive way is, well, it's, it's the information that the user is probably after which is being preserved in the, right. in the revisions. So whether or not it's got current um, ads from the current day rather than from you know, 2007, they're probably not going to care as long as they've got the information from the page from 2007. However, if you're actually interested in how 2007 sites looked because you're an HCI person, then you really don't care about the content. So that's, that's not a particularly uh, satisfying to, uh, answer to everyone. The way that we're looking at it at the moment, and this is this is very much research and not um, necessarily going to work, uh, is to use copy on write file systems, which preserve um, snapshots of every single change to the file system. You can do that directory by directory. So if you had all of your PHP files, for example, in snapshotting directories, you could then have a Mubuntu system on top of that which rolled your data back, or rolled your PHP back, I should say, to use the version um, at the time that you wanted, so that then you really would have uh, the, the process archived as well as the content. So yes, thank you, that was a very good question. Thank you, Rob. You've made fabulous progress since we last um, talked about this, and I'm glad I could have set you up so well. <laughs> It, I mean, it, it says we're really thinking about some of the same problems, and, and there's much uh, to go forward. Um, two questions, one kind of a short one and one a longer one, if, if I may. Um, the shorter one is on your slide about the branding, and, and I'm wondering why it is that you're thinking of that as a branding issue as opposed to a question of identity and persistence so that people can know ex exactly where each one came from. Right, it's, it, they're very much uh, interrelated problems. So, uh, and it also comes to trust at the same time. That right. if, uh, you, if you don't know, or if, you, if the user is not informed as to where each resource that makes up the view comes from, then there are three problems. You, uh, you lose, the branding for the uh, archive, in which case they don't get any name recognition, they can't then sell themselves as, you know, look, we're the Internet Archive, or we're the British Library's Web Archive, we get so many hits and you know, people know our name. So if you just had an, uh, a video archive, or an image, or even worse, a CSS archive, a CSS archive is the worst of all possible situations because you'll never see the CSS because it's a process on top of the HTML. So why would anyone give money to run or use money to run a CSS archive, even though it would be particularly valuable? Um, the user then also can't see where it comes from, which means that they don't have any, um, a, any information available to them to know whether they can trust the representation that's being delivered to them. So if this came from a, if this image came from an untrustworthy source that instead replaced every single image of Bill Clinton with Mickey Mouse, it, the browser would still say, well, hey, this is the closest in time image for this particular uh, original resource. I should display it. So uh, at the moment, everything is fine because only trustworthy archives are available. However, in the future, if this were to really take off, you might have spammers creating their own memento archives of ads, just to insert, be inserted into pages. Um, and in that case, we really need to be able to know 
whether or not we can trust where this image is coming from, and to do that we need to know the archive. This one. Did, did that answer the question? It, it did. Um, let me pose the other one just to frame it, but then give David his time, and if you have time to come back to mine, fine. It's on the slide that you had before with your three little charts about reproducibility dropping early on, that one. Um, if, if we have time to talk about that in more depth, I hope we will, because I mean, I think you're, you're exactly right here, and I'm thinking about streaming data, which is harder and harder to reconstruct, whether it's the sensor networks, the flux net, all kinds of observational climate data have these characteristics. And the reproducibility problem, which is ex an extremely high bar, even though that word is kind of scattered around the data management plans, it's a really, really high bar to think about. So let me hold that and, not to, and leave to David. And if we have time to come back, please do. Yeah. Uh, right, I, I really want to get back to that issue. But I just wanted to point out that it's not a hypothetical issue here. And in a, in a January post on my blog, I use the example of a journal called Graph, which went out of publication and is now claimed to be available from four separate archives. Um, there's Portico. Portico claims to have it, and they do in fact have it, but you need to pay them in order to get it, which most people won't be able to. Secondly, the KB. The KB has it, but you can only get at it if you're at the KB. Uh, thirdly, the Internet Archive claims to have it. And what they have is the front page, the abstracts of all the articles, and for every full text article, they have a login page because the Internet Archive, it, this was a subscription journal, and they, didn't, they couldn't collect the actual text. And then there's Clocks, which has uh, triggered this content. It's open access. All the content is there. So that uh, in this framework where it's entirely up to an archive, what they claim to have, you have three chances out of four that one, when you follow your nose, you're going to end up at something that isn't actually the content you want. And this is a serious problem. We are going to have effectively the analog of search engine optimization wars in archiving. And, and uh, the, the branding issue is just the, the tip of this iceberg. And, and I, I, I really thank you for addressing this, but this is just this is the, 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 the leading edge of a big problem. But let's get back to Christine's oh, uh, point. I imagine that um, Chris has something to say about that from the Internet Archive point of view. So I just wanted to build on uh, what both of you have talked about for a minute. Um, and going back to a couple of themes that Christine mentioned around marrying policy and incentives. I think one of the big challenges in a lot of the archives that maintain large collections of web data, for example, it's not just an issue of branding. It goes back to what are the constraints that that particular institutional entity has to operate under. And one of the um, results is not only this problem of can the archive collect material in the first place, right, uh, crossing barriers, but also then can it be redisplayed? So in some cases, image content may not appear on a public archive because it happens to be individually excluded based on an active robots.txt. And for archives like the Internet Archive, we actually check those exclusions um, and cache them in 24-hour windows. So if there's an active exclusion, that may not be the same site owner, same publisher, doesn't matter. For that particular URI, we have to respect those constraints in order to maintain the level of openness that we're able to provide. For national libraries, they follow you know, completely different standards, and every individual archive is beholden to a different set of policies and legislation. So one idea that we've actually been trying to explore within the community and be interested in hearing some thoughts about this is to borrow from the internet security industry and their concepts around these anonymous data collaboratives. So conceptually, what you enable individual actors to do is to contribute information about locations on the web. 
but you do that in an anonymous way so that you have a repository that's in aggregate reflective of all the activity and you have a little bit more information about what's going in and out. So imagine a, con uh, a context in which Memento as a researcher tool in the global community could leverage that kind of data set and know where these various resources were located. And even if we had to you know, uh, work in this imperfect context where some material couldn't be made publicly accessible um, and you'd have to be on site or you'd have to uh, present credentials as a validated researcher in you know, uh, recognized academic contexts, et cetera. Um, it may be a stepping stone toward getting towards some of the quality issues and also trust that both of you have, have articulated. Anyway, it's, it's something we're all struggling with. We're trying to figure out how do we contribute, how do we maximize the openness, because this open versus closed world is incredibly difficult to, to navigate. And it only, Memento only works if we can maximize the amount of information that's available for the collection of data sets of interest. And then we can get to the point where hopefully the content follows from there. I think that you, so uh, I, I have no, nothing further to add, <laughs> essentially, um, on, on that topic, other than that, although in the current implementation all of the time gates are completely open, you could have time gates that were community specific, in which you had to pres authenticate to the time gate, either via a username and password, via shibboleth, uh, via open ID, that sort of thing, um, in which case, after you've established your credentials with the time gates, which is the, the resource that does the, all the redirections, it could then make better decisions for you as to where you would want to be taken. And that information um, that, Chris, uh, yeah, that Chris was just talking about um, would be perfect in order to make those sorts of decisions. Um, so for example, uh, the Austrian um, web archive, you can only access when you're um, on site. Although I, understand that that might be changing. Um, if they had a, uh, a policy where only people who are currently in Austria, as opposed to only within their library, can do it, then you can, you can imagine a time gate which people in, in the .at domain could use in order to access resources from the .at domain that were archived. Um, so yeah, there's a couple, of, a couple of ways that Memento may be able to help in that regard using the sorts of information that um, Chris and David were talking about. I'm glad Chris brought the open closed in, because that, that's the, one of the policy flags. And I guess maybe the only other thing to pursue at this point is the degree to which Memento may be able to respect policy flags also. And this is a big move of Creative Commons and, and Science Commons, too, is to try to mark data in ways that you know what rights are attached to it. And that that's going to be one more, I mean, to talk about an intersection of technology, people, and policy, I mean, that, that's really it right there that we've got to deal with. Thank you. Um, and would you see that information being attached at the, the URI level? Um, so, for example, in the HTTP response, you'd get back a link to a Creative Commons license to say that this particular resource has this license and means that that could be respected, or at the collection level where you'd say all of these resources have this particular policy attached to them. Well, you're far better the technical expert on that than I am. Um, but. Let me, let me take that back up to a larger question, and it's one that um, I've raised within the board, uh, BIRDI, the Board on Research Data and Information, I hope will be addressed at this August meeting at, at Berkeley with um, DataCite and, and some others, and BIRDI's doing part of that, is that the, you know, the kind of the policy pressure has been on getting people to cite data properly. But my argument is the problem starts much earlier in the life cycle is people producing data have no real way of, 
uh, of marking it in any package of appropriate granularity to decide what to cite. And even if, even if the investigator says, okay, this is the right granularity, once it gets mixed up and mashed up in lots of other ways, whatever, whatever the unit is, is going to look very different to the reuser. So do you need to deal with the citation problem at the point of origin or farther down the line? Right now it's only being looked at farther down the line. We need to look at it at the point of origin if we're going to figure out how it's, whether it's going to be marked up with policy, with the persistent identifiers, so that Memento, ORE, anybody else can pick it up, Internet Archive, and be able to handle it properly. So. That was a fantastic conversation. Um, are there any other questions or, or comments? No? Well, with that. Christine another question? Yeah. Did you have another, another question, Christine? Or was that more towards the policy? Well, I'd like other people to have an opportunity. Other, surely there's other questions around here, and you and I can continue that one at length. No, well, we have another two or three minutes before the, the break, if you do want to ask it. Well, do you want to go back to that slide with your three cute little charts on it? Could you explain to us what you mean by reproducibility there? That, I think that would help. Right. Okay. So by reproducibility here, I mean uh, given the data and the process that you applied to the data, you end up with the same result. So given um, a data set, given some uh, code or some process that runs over top of that data set, if you can reapply the process at a later point in time to the data and you end up with the same result, then your, your experiment is reproducible. So here, as data changes, you can apply the same process to changing data and you'll, you'll end up with different results. So it's not reproducible because you don't have access to the prior state of the data. If you have a static uh, data set and a changing process, you have the same problem. So here, when you add those two together, those two vectors, you end up with a curve that trends towards zero. That's actually a fairly weak definition of reproducibility. <laughs> right. right that, that, that's, a, I mean, reproduci that's a low bar because you're just putting a black box in there, right. saying, given these inputs, do I get the same outputs? Where cre you know, creating the, recreating the experiment, recreating the study, which is much more what we're thinking about in terms of science, is way harder than that. Yes. Oh, yes. Yes. <laughs> I, I'm only talking about for the purposes of momentum. Okay. Reproducing um, access to computationally processable resources as we opposed to the entire scientific uh, domain. Which is mostly what Victoria Stodden is talking about in, in reproducibility, the, the, the computational, but that's a small subset of actual research that people would like to make reproducible. So that, that, that clarity helped is the, I think, again, when NSF says reproducibility in data management plans, it's meaning something much grander. And when the OI, OAIS guidelines say mandatory, all in bold, independently understandable, is having a much higher bar than what you've got here, and this is really hard right there. We, we only hope to uh, provide some small part of the solution towards this small part of the very large problem. Yes, thank you for <laughs> making me clarify that. Okay, well, thank you all very much for attending.